Welcome back for another episode of Code Club. It's great to have you here. In the last episode, we talked about joining data frames together that have the same structure. You'll remember that for each region of the 16S RNA gene, we have a file with the counts for the number of times each amplicon sequence variant, or ASV, shows up in each genome. Now, we used map underscore DFR to elegantly read in each file and depend the contents of each file together. This all worked because all of the files had the same column names and the same types of data in those columns. It was elegant because it didn't force us to repeat the same chunk of code over and over, and it allows us to easily add other regions as we progress with our project and perhaps decide to add another region. But what if we had different bits of information for the same genomes? For instance, imagine that for some reason we wanted to join those data together column-wise. To make that work, we would need to make sure that our data frames all had the same genomes or ASVs in the rows. Now, more likely, we would need to use a different set of methods, which we'll learn today called joins. The dplyr package has a number of joins for adding columns to data frames, which describe similar entities. For example, let's think of two data frames, one listing the number of copies of the RN operon in several genomes, and another listing the number of ASVs in another set of genomes, and there might be overlap in the genomes that are represented in the two data frames. We would like to have a single data frame that has a column for the name of the genome, the number of copies of the RN operon, and the number of ASVs in those genomes. If you look at my example here, you'll see that the same genomes are not represented in both data frames. We can use the inner join command to join the two data frames together using the genome column. If the genome is missing from either data frame, it will not appear in the join data frame. There are other variants on the inner join function available in dplyr that treat missing data differently. Full join, left join, right join. But I'm hard pressed to remember when I've ever actually used them. Now, perhaps we had a bunch of genomes like we do here in our project, and it's hard to spot if any of the genomes are missing from the two data frames. To figure this out, we'll use a different join called an anti-join. In an anti-join, the rows from the left data frame that are missing from the right are outputted to the screen, or as a variable. We can switch the order of the data frames to see which rows in the second data frame are missing from the first. That's pretty slick, huh? In today's episode, we'll see how we can use inner join and anti join to combine the metadata and taxonomy data that we downloaded from the RNDB, along with mapping data that we can get from the NCBI's taxonomy database. The goal is to create a file that will have columns indicating the name of each genome, perhaps the GenBank accession number or the genome database accession number, those, that GCF identifier, along with the columns indicating the taxonomy data for the genomes. Then in future episodes, this will help us to group our ASV data by different taxonomic levels to assess how unique each ASV is to different taxonomic groups and to see how many ASVs can represent each taxonomic group. Even if you're only watching this video to learn more about R and don't have a clue what a 16S RNA gene is, much less an amplicon sequence variant, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of today's episode. Please take the time to follow along on your own computer. If you haven't been following along but would like to, welcome! Please be sure to check out the blog post that accompanies this video where you'll find instructions on catching up, reference notes, and links to supplemental material. The link to the blog post for today's episode is below in the notes. To get us going, I've already created an issue, issue number 24, which asks us to create a mapping file to translate between the genome ID and the taxonomic information. And so what we'd like to get out is a new file that contains the columns containing the genome GenBank accession number, the RDP taxonomy hierarchy, so things you know from the kingdom down to genus, the species name, and the scientific name, uh, which will likely contain the strain name if it's available. Not every species name has a strain name with it. So we'll keep this information. And again, we'll see in future episodes how we can use this to group our amplicon sequence variant data by uh, different taxonomic levels. So this is issue 24. Let's go over to the terminal and I'll move to our project root directory. I'm on the master branch and I wanna go ahead and create my branch, issue branch. So I'll do git branch issue 24 Get checkout, issue 24, and we're in good shape. Now, what I'd like to do is let's go ahead and use Microsoft Excel. See, Microsoft Excel isn't worthless. It's good for many things. 
Um, and I will open up in my data raw, which is where I think I have the RNDB, uh, this TSV um, metadata file. And this has information about all of the files, all of the sequences. Um, and so this is a tab separated value. So I'm going to kind of go through this dialog and finish importing that. I could have read it into, Microsoft, into R, but eh, uh, it's okay. And, and so it got parsed a little bit funny, I think. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird how it got parsed. Anyway, I'm, I'm just using it as a graphical way to look at the data. And what you'll see in the first column is the data source. Um, some of the data in the RNDB came from empirical studies where people looked at, um, you know, kind of lab-based methods of getting the copy numbers. Um, and others are these GCFs. The GCF files or accession IDs are the actual genome sequence data, which we've been working with as we've gone through our project. Um, in the second column, if I come back up to the top here, we have our uh, NCBI taxonomy ID, data source. We have a scientific name um, here in column F. Uh, we have the RDP taxa uh, based again on the, um, the, the genus name. Um, and in this column over here, we can see that we have the um, RDP taxonomy string, right? So this is our taxonomic information. And what I'm looking for in an ideal world would be a column that only had the species name, <laughs> but we're not gonna be so lucky, right? So if I look at this column that has the, the scientific names or whatever, you'll see that this is Escherichia coli, which is the genus and species name, but it also has all this strain information. Um, I'd like to think that maybe we could find a way to parse this out, um, but it, I don't think it's so simple, right? So here's a pasturella with subspecies that. So it's got subspecies. Again, Escherichia had strain. It's just kind of a hot mess. And what we're going to do is, again, we're going to think about how we can link this to other data to get the species information into a file like this. Now, another file that we have that we've gotten from the RDP um, if I can open this up, maybe I'll do it through Excel. Uh, open, and is this um, this pan taxa stats NCBI. And so this is a tab separated value uh, file. And this contains summary output for each tax ID, right? So this B column in this RNDB 5.6, which I have behind here, links to this tax ID in column A of this pan taxa stats file. And then we see that the first column is species and that what we get are um, our names, uh, our species names, right? Uh, the problem is, however, that not everything in B uh, shows up uh, in um, A of our pan taxa stats file because there's subspecies names, right? And so we need a way to link between a species, subspecies name and the species that it belongs to. Uh, what I'll just briefly also point out with this pan taxa stats file is this tells us for each species, um, so like say, um, I don't know, pick this one, uh, Acinetobacter uh, wolfii um, has one representative, it has six copies, um, in its genome. And so again, we can kind of see all these stats. I'm not so concerned about these stats, we can recreate them on our own. But what I want to use this for is to link this tax ID from the metadata file to this tax ID in the Pantax of stats to then get us the species, right? So what you're thinking about as I was talking about the joins, we kind of want to be able to join these two files together. The challenge is that we're going to need a third file to link this tax ID for the subspecies name to the species name. So to do that, let's go ahead and go over to uh, the NCBI website. So ncbi.nlm.nih.gov. And they have so much data and most people only use the web interface to access that data. If I come down here on the left to taxonomy, this brings me to the taxonomy database. 
And you can search for all sorts of things in here, all sorts of organisms, and find linked data that say linked to Escherichia coli or Homo sapiens or whatever you're interested in. But you can also download all this data, right? So we can, through the, FT, through the FTP site, if I click on this link, this brings us to kind of behind the scenes, the back end of the website where they make their data available. And I'm looking through these, and what I generally look for are the readme files. And so, um, let's see, what looks interesting? I'm gonna go ahead and start back at, um, let's see, this NCBI taxonomy genus. Um, so looking at this, this isn't necessarily what I'm interested in. Um, it's kind of explaining how they name things. Let me look at this next one, taxcatreadme.txt. Again, I'm looking for something that will allow me to relate the subspecies tax ID number to the species tax ID number. And so taxcat dump compressed archive contains a single file. Um, Categories.dmp, it contains a single line for each node that is at or below the species level. We're winning. The first column is the top level category, so what kind of domain it belongs to. The third column um, is the tax ID itself, and the second is the corresponding species level tax ID. Winning, right? And so as an example, this is like, they knew exactly what we were looking for, it's beautiful. Um, so we see Acetolobus uh, sacrovorans is the species name. Acetolobus sacrovorans, I think they just wanted to get me to say that, uh, 34515. So this is the strain name. And so what you'll see is that the entry for uh, sacrovorans is this first one, where the subspecies and the sp species have the same tax ID. But this other one that has the strain 345-15 is the 666510. So that's in the third column, and that maps to the species name. So this is what we want. We want this um, tax cat file, and in it contains this category.dmp, categories.dmp. So again, what we want is this tax cat, tax cat dot zip. And so we're gonna download that and decompress it. We've seen how to do that in some of the earlier episodes. And so instead of kind of reinventing the wheel, if you will, and what we can relate this to is kind of the um, git rndb files.sh script. And we can, um, if you'll recall, those files came to us as zip files. This file that we're gonna download is also a zip file. And what I'm gonna do is create a new file and encode, and this will be get species subspecies uh, lookup dot sh. And I'm gonna copy this from my RNDB script to my new script. Go ahead and close the RNDB so I'm not gonna accidentally write over it. Um, and we will see the inputs, there's no input. The output is a file that will be data references, um, SPSPP lookup.tsv. Uh, we don't need this target or path processing information and the path is going to be data references and the URL, I'm gonna come back to this, taxcat.zip, copy that link and paste that in there. And that looks good. Let me just make the font a smidge smaller. Hopefully you can still see that okay. We will then unzip, um, and again, this is gonna go to uh, data references, and this is going to be taxcat.zip. And I think we need the path. Yeah, so this is gonna be uh, data references, taxcat.zip, because again, this is gonna get dumped into data references. So we do need the path. We need to tell it where we wanna put it. Um, you'll recall that this all was to be some error tracking. If the unzip didn't work, we didn't want it to silently fail. We wanted to give it a loud fail. And instead of touching the target, what we'll do is we'll move um, data references uh, categories.dmp to data references forward slash um, spspp lookup dot tsv. And that should be good. I'm gonna copy this 
so that I can create my make file rule and maybe let's see um, yeah up here where I'm still getting try to give it some organization try to put kind of like the downloads up at the top for the reference materials and things like that and then the it's gonna be the code get species SPP lookup.sh and what we'll then do is the recipe to carry that out will be this and I need to make this executable so I'll do chmod plus X on that and then I'll run that and so this downloads so far so good uh, uh, looks like everything worked let me look at uh, data references and we'll see that I've got my SPP SP SPP lookup .tsv. Uh, that's in there I'm gonna go ahead and look at the top of that so head data references SP SPP that so again we got three columns and something I notice here is that there are no column names so when we read this in uh, to R we're gonna need to add column names when we do that it's not a big deal um, but it's just one more thing to be mindful of all right so I'm gonna now go ahead and open up our studio and we can do that with the Schloss Proj, um, our Proj uh, file. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new R script. At the top of this, I'll put library uh, tidyverse. And what I'd first like to do is to read in the metadata. And we'll do metadata, uh, read TSV, uh, data, um, raw, RNDB. Yep. I got the wrong one. Um, and from here, we want this 5.6.tsv. Generally, as I'm kind of developing my pipeline, I don't want to assign it to a variable immediately because I want to see what the output looks like. Ah, I forgot to load the library. Okay. So we look at this. Let's give some more room for the console. And we see that this stuff all read in with these different specifications. I'm cool with that. And I'm going to rename some of these columns so they're easier to work with. So I'll do rename and um, let's see, NCBI tax ID. Uh, I'm going to rename that as um, subspecies ID equals that. I'm also going to change um, RDP taxa to be RDP. All right, and I, of course, also need my data source record ID because that's going to be the genome ID. Is that? And I'd also like to get the scientific name, the NCBI scientific name. And so we'll call that scientific name. Goes that. Now let me run all this again. And, ah. Uh, for some reason, it's still remove that, run all this. And what we see is we get a lot of stuff back. Um, I don't really need all this, so I'm going to go ahead and simplify it and do select. Um, let's see. Uh, genome ID, subspecies ID, RDP, and scientific name. And this then gives us a four column data frame. Uh, again, remember at the top we have these RNDB genome IDs and these were empirically determined, not from sequencing. To get a sense of what it looks like at the end, I could add a tail and we see kind of what things look like here. And so we've got the genome ID, which links back to our sequence data, the subspecies ID, which we're gonna use to map with that um, SP, SPP uh, map file. We've got the RDP taxonomy, um, actually, I think this is the wrong one. This is only showing the genus name, uh, not the full thing and the scientific name. So let me think. Um, uh, what we wanted actually was the RDP taxonomic lineage. Uh, we might like to use the NCBI taxonomic lineage, but uh, this shows up as call logical because it's not populated um, in the table. So we can't use that. Um, and I, I don't think it really matters for our purposes. And so here now we see that we've got domain, and then if we looked at this for proteobacteria, it'd be phylum. So we've got what we want. I'll go ahead and remove that tail part and assign this to metadata. Go ahead and load that in. So we've got our metadata loaded. Okay, 
The next thing I'd like to load is our um, SP, SPP lookup. And that's going to be read TSV. And it's going to be in uh, data references. And we call that SPP, SPP lookup. And again, um, before we get too far ahead, um, I ran that. And we see that we get um, that it parses and it gives the columns B7. And because 7 was in the third column, it gives it 7, 1. It's not what we want. Um, get rid of that assignment arrow for right now. And we can do call names. And we can then give it column names. So we'll then say domain. And the first column is the species ID. And the third column is the subspecies ID. Uh, this is kind of running off the screen. So I'll go ahead and put an enter there, run that. And we see that we have domain, subspecies ID, and subspecies ID. Great. And we run all this. And so now we have species, subspecies lookup. So the third part we need is that taxonomy name to get the, the species name, rather from our um, that pantaxa file, right? And so we will then do read TSV and um, it's in data raw um, RNDB and this was uh, pantaxa stats ncbi.tsv. Running that, we see we've got tax ID, rank, and name and um, that all looks good. Um, the tax ID, we might prefer it to be like species ID, but we won't worry about that for right now. I think what I'll do is I'll actually go ahead and filter this to only have rank um, equals species. And you'll see that we now only have 4,829 rows versus up here we had like 6,819. And instead of name, I'm going to change that to be species. Rename uh, species equals um, name. And running that, we now see that we've changed the name there. And perhaps we'll do a select where we'll get tax ID and species. It just kind of keeps our data frames simple. And I'll go ahead and call this tax. All right. So we've got our three data frames, which are going to be the metadata, the species lookup, and the tax taxonomy data. So we want to join all these together, right? So if we look at metadata, we see that we've got a genome ID, a subspecies ID, the RTP and scientific name. If we then look at our species lookup, we've got species ID, subspecies ID. So let's start there. And we can do an inner join. And we will do uh, metadata, comma, SP, SPP lookup. And, and so what this is going to do, it's going to join the two data frames together. It's going to look for a column that has the same name in both data frames. And what you can kind of see in this output that came to the screen briefly was that it's joining by subspecies ID. If we want to be explicit about what we're joining by, we could add by equals subspecies ID. Uh, one of the nice things about renaming your columns is that it's uh, pretty smart <laughs> that it could figure out the columns for you. And so again, we do that inner join. That brings it all together for us. We can go ahead and uh, select some of the data frames we want. So we want the genome ID. Um, we no longer need the subspecies ID, but we need the RDP, the scientific name, uh, domain, or we don't need domain, and species ID. Again, we could have done this with negative signs and have been less typing, but eh, this works. And so again, we've got genome, we've got the taxonomy hierarchy, the scientific name, and the species ID. Wonderful. So now we want to do another another join to our taxonomy data. What we could do is create what we have here on 21 and 22 as a single data frame and then do another join. But what I'd like to do is do another inner join directly as part of this pipeline because I don't need 
I don't need the output of 21 and 22 for its own sake. What we can do then is you'll notice here in inner join that we have a data frame on the left, one on the right, and that inner join is looking for a data frame on the left and the right. And so the data frame that we're going to put on the left is a period to indicate the data flowing through the data through uh, the inner join. And on the right, I'm going to go ahead and put tax. And we can run all this. And you'll notice that we get an error because by must be supplied when x and y have no common variables. Arg. So what columns does tax have? Well, it has tax ID, whereas our data frame here has species ID. So again, we could rename our column names like we've done earlier today. But what I want to show you is a different way to do this. We could do by, like we had above. And the syntax we'll use is to say C, the concatenate function with parentheses, and then in quotes, equaling something in quotes. And the column, the information in quotes is the column name for the data frame on the left. And the second set of quotes is the column name for the data frame on the right. So for the the data frame coming through the pipeline, um, again, this is going to be a species ID. And on the right um, is going to be tax ID. And we run all that, and this works, great. So we've got the genome ID, the RDP, scientific name, species ID, and species. Uh, we're not going to need the species ID, right? So we could go ahead and drop that. But something that occurs to me is We'd like to double check <laughs> that everything that we have in our um, our joined metadata and species lookup is also in our taxonomy file. Okay, and you'll recall that to do that, I mentioned we could do anti-join. Again, we run this, and we get out a data frame with 26 rows actually, where the information that's in our metadata doesn't map to that summary data from the taxonomy data. And so that's a bit concerning. And so what we'd like to do is perhaps figure out what these are and then add them back to our taxonomy data. And what I will do is I will add to this account function on um, the species ID to find out which species IDs are missing. And what we find is that there are four species IDs that are missing. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a data frame like tax. So if you recall, tax has a tax ID and a species name. Well, I'm going to create one that's got uh, these four species ID names. And what we'll do is I'll come back up here and I'll call this makeup tax. And we can create a tibble with the tibble function. And I'll put this in here. And right now, all I want are to get these ID numbers. And we'll do that. Put these all in quotes. Oops. And again, this is species ID. And we need uh, the, the, the name, right? Or no, the species, sorry. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and let's see. If we take that whole string and we come back to the taxonomy database, I plug those in up here. Is it going to give them to me? No, it doesn't like, it doesn't like the quotes. Aha, wonderful. Now, it's probably all out of order. <laughs> so I'm going to open these up as different tabs and figure out what what number corresponds to each. So let's see, Vibrio Atlanticus is 693153. 693, that's the last one. All right, so that's Vibrio Atlanticus. We're good there. Um, this Candidatus is 412965. That's the third one. And uh, let's see, what's Elastipes? That's 328. OK. 
Okay. And then this other one is probably Frankincella Orientalis. I love bacterial names. They're kind of cool. Makes me wish I would have paid more attention in Latin class. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and close that. And so now what we've got, oh, we've got an extra parentheses. Let's see. Let's see. I... Extra comma, one, two, three, four. Ah, I don't have a comma after my first thing. Okay, so that works. That works. And we can look at makeup tax. And we've got this new uh, smaller data frame that has four species IDs that were missing from our tax. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to then do bind rows onto tax. So I'm going to do, again, like we saw with the inner join, the period comma. So the period represents the information, the data frame flowing through the pipeline to that point. And I'm going to bind by row wise to the end, make up tax, run that. That looks good. Now let me redo my anti join this data frame and Let's see, why isn't this not working? Ah, I suspect the problem is that I've got makeup tax as character rather than as an integer. So I'll remove these quotes. Run that. Run this. And then do that. I think the problem is that I screwed up my tax ID. Uh, that, that instead of species ID, this should be tax ID. And if I come back up here, this is tax ID. Bonus points to you if you noticed that before I did. Now let's do our tax ID, tax inner join, and then we get out our inner join having no rows. Excellent. I'd kind of like to um, use this as a test. And what I'll do is I'll say test equals this. And what I want to make sure is that um, as output to this, I want to say n row equals equals zero. And so my test is going to determine whether or not the anti join is empty. Because say I come through and I use a new version of the RNDB if it's ever released, released later this fall, I'd like to, for it to yell at me uh, if there's a problem. And so we'll say test true. And what we can do is we can say stop if not uh, test is true. And uh, not 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 right. And so what would happen is that it would run through here and the program would keel over and die and yell um, if test was false. So if there are rows in here, then it would say false. All right. So let's go ahead and take this down here. And so we will then, instead of the anti join, because at this point we're ready for it to be the inner join, we can then run all this. And we know that we've got the same thing, um, the same information in both of the data frames we're joining here. The information I'd like to keep to output, I will use the genome ID because we need that to join on our, our Tibble file, right? Uh, we want the RDP, we want the species, and we want the scientific name, right? Oh, genome ID, not is. So I'm going to write this out as a TSV to data references, and I will call it genome ID uh, taxonomy.tsv. That should be good. And again, if we then look at data references, we sort it by time modified. You see this shows up first. And again, if I do head on uh, genome ID taxonomy, 
we see we've got all the information. And we've got the information we expect on the back end. Now you'll see this taxonomy string from the RDP is a bit of a mess. And in the next episode, come back. So be sure you like and subscribe to the video and click on the bell so you know when the video is released. Um, we'll talk about how we can take this column and split it into multiple columns so that we then have columns for everything from the domain or kingdom all the way down to species or even the strain. Okay, so be sure you come back. What we can then do, um, let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. So I'm going to save this as um, into code and I'm going to call this, um, let's see, get genome ID taxonomy dot R and in my files I'm going to go ahead and look at a previous R script I had to get my shebang line and all this other stuff um, and again the file name is get genome ID taxonomy dot R and so the input are going to be several different files so this will also be important to gather the files that we are using uh, so we make, when we make our rule in our make file. Let's see, so there's that. There's this, the lookup file. And there's also uh, the Pantaxa stats file, right? Good. So we'll save that. The output then is um, TSV containing the genome ID along with um, taxonomic information. And so that'll be good. And um, I'll go ahead and put that in there, uh, what the actual name is. So this data references file, all right. I'll come back to my make file and let's um, put this here and the, the, the script that we used was code uh, get genome ID taxonomy dot R and uh, the other prerequisites for this are all where'd you go right here so lots of copying and pasting really cuts down on typos as you can see if you've watched any of these videos in the past you know that I am very good at typos and bump that back and we need to put backslashes at the end of each of these lines to say that the lines all go together that's great I need to make this R script executable Make sure everything is saved and chmod plus x that and now I can um, I'm going to go ahead and test the make file by trying to make this and maybe I'll double check what it's going to try to do. It looks like I made a couple changes along the way um, and this is probably going to trigger <laughs> may trigger uh, generating a bunch of other stuff. That's okay. Um, we'll go ahead and do it right. Run that. And we're good. I'll double check it's up to date. We're in good shape. And we can get status. And we see that we've modified the make file and made two other files. So I'll go ahead and do git add make file and then code get genome code get sp okay get commit and then I will say create uh, genome to taxonomy mapping file closes number 24 get checkout master get merge 24. Our studio is freaking out because I've moved things. Um, close that and merge that. We're in good shape. And then we'll do git push 
And that should get up to GitHub, close out these browser tabs, and we see that it went ahead and closed it. So again, there's a lot going on in this episode, but the thing I really wanted to focus on and emphasize today was those joins. Uh, the inner join is really powerful for taking different pieces of data and merging them together. And, and you can imagine the next step might be to take our genome um, ID taxonomy file and join that to our count tibble file, right? To join those together so that we could then do a group by species or do a group by any other taxonomic level. And so again, these joins are super powerful and it really makes dplyr just such a useful function, sorry, set of functions, a useful package. Uh, it's just really helpful. And also we talked about anti-join, which allows us to see what's missing uh, on the, what's found in the left side that's not found in the right side and vice versa if you flip the order of those columns. So go ahead and play around with those joins with your own data. Um, I'd love to see perhaps how you're thinking about blending together different types of data. Um, I've, I've used this in the past when I've got, uh, say, observations or say I've got um, species richness data that's perhaps been generated by mother and I've got metadata and I want to build a plot where I say um, plot the, the species richness and I want to color it by, say, patient's diagnosis or by um, some type of treatment group, right? So being able to merge our data from uh, one source, like say mother, or from experimental data with metadata or attributes of those samples is really powerful for grouping things by making plots and any other thing you can think of. So play around with that. I'd love to see what you're coming up with and how you're using it. Go ahead and put it down below in the notes to this episode. Um, if you've got any questions, also feel free to put questions down there. Be sure that you like this video, hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell so you know when that next episode comes, where we'll talk about separating out that RDP column to the different taxonomic levels. Keep practicing. I believe you can do this stuff. You can. Uh, we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.